All right, welcome back to another episode here, Persuasion by the Pint. Episode number 20, if I'm not mistaken, Sean. But I, I am, that is correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just had a, um, it just escaped me. I'm like, where are we at? So, uh, by the way, I'm Jonathan Taylor along with Sean McCool. And uh, we're uh, continuing, um, continuing with Breakthrough Advertising. We teased a little bit last, uh, last episode what we're going to be talking about, but a lot of people may have forgotten. So what are we going to be talking about today? Yeah, so we're, we're digging deep here. Um, you know, we've camped out here for a little while because there is so much in this book. Yep. Um, this is my third or fourth <laughs> time going through it. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's good stuff. But he's talking about in this chapter what is referred to, he calls it, well, he describes advertising as the literature of desire, mm -hmm. which I love that phrase. He says it's it is society's encyclopedia of dreams, our twentieth century wish book. You know, remember the Sears wish book? Yep. You know, advertising is a big part of getting people to think bigger, dream bigger, you yeah. know, all this stuff. So I love that he said advertising is the literature of desire. So so many times people would say, you know, sales and advertising and persuasion is like this evil, bad thing. Um, but to no, I when I was a he, kid, I mean, didn't you love getting that big, huge the, Sears and Roebuck catalog, catalog and yeah. flipping back to the like the toy section, which and, was like the second, the whole half, <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. half of it. Yeah, I mean, it, and it stoked your desire for right. all these different things, you know, and and advertising can do that whether it's for weight loss, whether it's for a new business opportunity, mm -hmm. a new car, a new house, you know, or whatever. So we're going to get into how do we create that advertising so that it truly does. Yeah. You know, fan those flames of desire. So yeah. that's what we're going to be talking about in this, in this chapter. And we're going to split it up a thing into two episodes because there's a lot to cover. But before we do that, we have a mm. tasty black. Well, we don't know if it's tasty yet. I don't know anyway. I um, do. <laughs> <laughs> a black mocha stout. Yeah. So this is uh, one of my favorite um, brewing companies. They're based out of, it's Highland Brewing. They're based over in Ashland, North Carolina, which is, if you've ever been to Ash. No, I mean, Ashland, Asheville, North Carolina. But uh, if you've ever been over there, I really like that place. We go over there. It's like an hour and a half away from where we live. So we yep. like to go over there like on a weekend, get away, my wife and I, and just like chill. It's kind of an artsy town. But um, I really like this brew. This is um, one that I just picked up last week at when you we were shopping over at Earth Fair. And I picked it up. I had not seen this one. Um, I've had the oatmeal porter and some of the others, but, um, this is a new one. So this is a, um, stout and it's a, uh, what is it? The, uh, black, the black mocha stout. Yeah. It says on the box here, it says, uh, bold coffee and dark chocolate notes command <clears throat> is award-winning dry mm -hmm. stout. Yeah. Rich and malty. Yep. Rich and malty. That sounds like a band or something. Or Rich and malty. Yeah. A duo country group. <laughs> <laughs> Rich and Malty. Rich and Malty. All right. All right. Let's now it's time for the for the test. Yep. Now, I'm not going to say anything because I had some of this over the weekend. That's good. I yep. like it. That's um pretty thick. Definitely the coffee hits you after. Yeah. After you swallow it and let mm -hmm. it sit there for a while it's definitely got like a coffee aftertaste mm -hmm. in a good way no um yeah that's it feels like i get, I get more and more coffee as i sit here mm -hmm. <laughs> it's got that um it's almost like um i go up to honeybee coffee up here locally yeah. in town yep and they will do so they have coffee in the mornings and well, they have coffee all day but they also have uh, on tap beers on tap and they'll add a shot of cold brew to any of your beers that you mm -hmm. want. And I usually get like in the stouts or the porters, I'll get mm -hmm. a shot of cold brew yeah. that they dump in there. And that's, that's what it tastes like. It tastes very similar. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's good. Yeah. If you're, if you're uh, a coffee drinker, uh, you'll love, I think you'll like this. Cause yeah, it's, if it's you like, that. if you don't like coffee, you won't like this. Yeah. Yeah. It has a definite, very clear coffee taste yeah. at the end for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, I think this is a winner. That's a good one. I uh, I had also, again, like I said, the uh, oatmeal porter is a good one, but I thought I want to try this one because I was I kind of was in the mood for a darker beer. Now, the porter's good, but uh, 
This the stouts. I think the stouts a winner. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. If yeah. you can see, if you're not on um, YouTube watching us, you should be. Yeah. Um, but I tell you, working the glass in the book that we're reading around the <laughs> microphone boom is has its own I little challenge. Put the coaster up. Man, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all right, because um, we do use the books a lot. Yeah. You know, because we, I mean. Why try to make this stuff up when yeah. it's been so well written and just kind of expand on it and pull it? I can tell you in this chapter per, in particular, um, we are hitting the highlights. Highlights. This is a pretty yeah. robust chapter. And yeah, it is. There's some extended <clears throat> body copy that he pulls from old ads mm-hmm. that are the wordsmithing is really strong. Yeah. Um, and one thing Eugene Schwartz was famous for when he wrote copy and when he wrote advertising was his ability to like just really what's called future pacing to put somebody in the experience of using the product Mm -hmm. or the service or whatever it was. And you see that all through this copy, some of which he wrote, I think, I don't think he wrote all of it, but the examples he pulled all do that. They like really do a good job of pulling you into the actual experience of using the product which he calls intensification, and that's what this chapter is Mm -hmm. about. Um, So he opens up and he says in this chapter, he says, the art of salesmanship fundamentally and primarily is expanding the desire that we've been talking about for Mm -hmm. a couple episodes now. You don't create the desire, you just tap into it. Yeah, Expanding it horizontally among more and more people and expanding it vertically by sharpening and magnifying it, by building it to such a pitch that it overcomes the obstacles of skepticism, lethargy, or lethargy, depending yep. on your pronunciation, and price and results in the sale. So we've got their attention with the headline, and now what we're trying to do is we're trying to intensify the already, you know, in some cases dormant desire, in some t- cases kind of just a little bit of desire. We're trying to intensify that so much that it begins to knock down any, yeah. you know, uh, objections or concerns or anything. It just gets so white hot that they just got to have our product to fulfill that desire. Yeah. So, so what we're doing is taking, uh, these vague, you know, desires that are more vague and kind of filling in the gaps, right? Giving them some concrete images to kind of, fi- you know, fill in the uh, details of what, what those desires will look like. Yeah, I love how Eugene Schwartz actually paints word pictures. And we've yeah. talked in the past about um, The Brilliance Breakthrough, which <laughs> is his other book, which is literally a workbook on how to construct sentences that create pictures in people's minds. Mm-hmm. He, I love what he says here early in the chapter. He says, you are literally the script writer for your prospect's dreams. You are the chronicler of his future. Your job is to show him in minute detail all the tomorrows that your product makes possible for him. Oh, wow. I like that. I mean, that's a strong, like, yeah. yeah. And it, it doesn't matter what it is. I don't care if it's the George Foreman grill, right? I right. mean, like the George Foreman grill, that's what it does. It, it's like your life's going to be easier. You're going to be thinner. You're yeah. going to have great tasting food. Oh, like, yeah. you know, the angels are going to sing when you cook dinner. The kids are going <laughs> to be at the table waving back and forth and like, you know, praising you because you're such a good cook yeah. and your wife's going to love you because cleanup is super easy and mm-hmm. quick. You just wipe the grease off. And like, I mean, that's the kind of stuff he's talking about where you just keep amplifying. And I think infomercials do a great job of that they better do. than a lot of, you know, big traditional Corporate, image yeah. branding type yeah. stuff. You know, they really like just keep ratcheting up. When I worked at Stansbury um, writing financial stuff, that's one thing we talked about was we, we would have the core <laughs> offer and then there'd be two or three secondary third offers. Mm-hmm. They were similar and matched, but they were a different offer. Yeah. And we would kind of ratchet up like the desire. Like, oh, I want this, but oh, wow, I want that. And the, oh, wow, I got to have that. And it just kept ratcheting it up, you know, mm-hmm. like a like a metric socket set. And it just would just, and it was just, you know, I mean, that's, that's what you want. Yeah. So the people have no choice but to buy. Right. Oh, I mean, that's where you definitely. want to have them. So anything you saw before we jumped in, um, before we jump into the actual techniques? Well, I just want to say, you know, and we've mentioned this in the past that, you know, advertising, 
what is the old saying? Advertising is salesmanship and print. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening to the podcast and you're thinking, you know, there's, they spend a lot of time, we're spending a lot of time talking about copy. Um, and if you're not paying attention, you know, to this, because, you know, you obviously, if you're in sales and if you have nothing to do with copy, this is some of this stuff is crucially important. Mm -hmm. And if you're not listening and paying attention and utilizing this in your industry, whatever your if you're sale if you're in sales or marketing, then you're really missing out um, because a lot of this applies, as we mentioned in the past, a lot of this doesn't just apply to to copywriters. It applies to marketing principles in general, salesmanship in general. Um, and if you can add some of the things that we talk about in this book on this particular section, which is talking about, you know, hitting on those desires and amplifying them, yep. then you can take that approach and add it into your own sales presentations and, you know, benefit yourself tremendously, you know, separate yourself from the competition. Yeah. And I would challenge you if you're a salesperson listening to this and you, you do, you know, you do all your sales through talking mm -hmm. and you've never taken the time to like write down what you say, yeah. especially the key points and really take the time to write and wordsmith some of the phrases, um, like we'll see in here you're doing yourself a disservice. Mm -hmm. You could create some catchphrases. You could create some metaphors, you know, some of the different things we'll talk about in here that you're going to have. I mean, you probably have done it. If you're a good salesperson, you've probably done it with any given client. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you notice it. If you're like me, when I've sold in the past, like I'll say some, some, I hear something coming out of my own mouth and right. I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. Right. I need to remember that. Right. And go back and write it down or put a, you know, put it in the notes in your, in your iPhone or whatever mm -hmm. and capture that and reuse it yeah. over and over and, and rework it, massage it and get it to where it's really, really strong. And if you're not doing that, if you're not, you know, taking that, that skill of copy, even if you do oral presentations, you're missing out. Yeah. You know, the greatest, a lot of the greatest speakers wrote their speeches and fine tune oh, them and then, you know. Some people, yeah, they can do it off the cuff, but even then they've spent a lot of time working through the phrases and all those kind of things. Yeah. And I, that's really what this chapter is, is talking about. Just as a side note, I was reading this past week, the guy that wrote, of course we're past Christmas, but <laughs> the guy that wrote Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was actually a copywriter. Yeah. I you, I'm sure you knew that. Did know that. Did not know that until I read that. I thought, man, that's pretty interesting. But that, that one little... Um, it's for a department store. He was yeah, a, he, he wrote a story for a department store, and then they gave him back the the license to mm -hmm. keep it, and that made him a wealthy man yeah. from that point on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, and you know co the the Santa that we know now is a yeah. is a Coca Cola product. Absolutely, that's why he's red and white. Yeah, as opposed to like if you go back in history, there's a lot of green and gold and other stuff in the yep. in the Santa robe, but the the most iconic. Santa is a Coca-Cola Santa. You <laughs> That's know? crazy. And so, yeah, I mean, we are, you know, especially in the West and especially in America, we're, I mean, a lot of the stuff we take for granted is mm -hmm. from advertising. Sure. You know, it's just, it's crazy um, how powerful and how prevalent it is in, in our world. Yeah. So. so number one, ways to intensify or, you know, the the process of intensification is what he calls it. Um, mm -hmm. I always thought it was funny. Like this book has such big words and, and it's <laughs> so like deep and he wrote such simple copy oh, when no. he wrote, yeah. but the, this, this book, is, this is, is a textbook, right? Yeah. Here. This, this is, is <laughs> like, yeah, it's funny how a guy that writes such simple copy yeah, and then this book is very complex yep. and some of the terms he uses and things like that. It's just kind of funny. Um, so the first thing he talks about is just flat out just the presentation of your claim. Yeah. Like you just start talking about, um, a detailed description of its appearance and the mm -hmm. results it gives, you know, yep. pretty, pretty basic, you know, um, you know, if you're talking about a sports car, you could talk about the curves of the sports car. You could talk about, you know, the color, you could yep. talk about the, the leather interior. So it's pretty much sure. features, um, you know, and then some, and the results like it's, you know, it's, you see this a lot in car commercials, especially if it's a sports car, then you'll see speed and horsepower mm -hmm. numbers and torque. If it's a truck commercial torque, 
um, payload, towing, all those kind of things. You know, there's a lot of images of the, you know, the truck itself on if it's a TV commercial. So that's just a very basic presentation of your claim. That doesn't yeah. take a lot of imagination no. to do that. Um, although he does give some great examples of like a, you know, a certain type of rose bush that, you know, um, this fabulous rose variety produced 500 blooms in June, 1,523 more in July, 1,616 more in August, 437 more in September, 4,076 roses all from one single plant. <laughs> so that's a lot of very specific. Yeah. And, and to a person who wants rose bushes in their yard, that's amazing. Yeah. Like that's that's something that they would key in on. Like, it, it, yeah, it definitely gets the attention. So you got to know who you're writing to and, and what you're writing about. Um. And then number two, putting the claims into action. Um, so this is basically kind of the follow up to that where you're uh, you put the, the product in action for your reader. OK, mm -hmm. how does that you're kind of backing up a lot of those claims? How does that work? Um, give some details you know, about that. And I think if you're doing video and video is becoming cheaper and cheaper to produce. But, you know, we see all these commercials on TV, on YouTube and other yeah. places. And, you know, it's easy to to make the mistake as a an advertiser or salesperson or a person who wants to influence a, a group of people. Mm -hmm. that those videos are just off the cuff, but but the good ones are scripted. Yeah. Like they're written out, they're storyboarded out, and there's a they're hitting a lot of the stuff that we're talking about yeah. in a very intentional way with the way they do the video. Yeah. The, and I go back to like the F-150 commercials, right? They're, you know, the truck is usually playing in sand and it's pulling big stuff or it's at a, you know, a lumber yard. Cause they know who They're their audience is. They're dumping a whole is. lot of stuff in the back of the yeah, just bed. Right? Yeah. It's, or it's pulling, you know, the big signs yep. and pulling stuff. So there's so much going on mm -hmm. and that's the big part of what they're doing is they're putting that truck in action yeah. in the video, you know, for you. And a, a lot of, um, products that are advertised on TV and internet everywhere now is, you know, we talked about last episode or a couple episodes about bounty, right? Yeah. They're always Quicker. showing that you're the Swiffer, yeah. you know, picking up the dirt or vacuum cleaners, picking up dirt and you know, they're showing the product in action. Yeah. And because video is so cheap now and so easy to produce, you should be showing your, your product right. in action whenever you can. Well, you, like you said earlier, those infomercials are some of the best at that mm -hmm. when they show, you know, you think like the flex seal or the flex tape that they show you all the demonstrations where yeah. it's like the guy's in a boat out in the lake, you yeah. know, where he's like cut, they've cut a boat in half and he's, you know, yeah. he's uh, moving right along on a boat that's been taped, you know, back together. So yeah. that's pretty, that's pretty, you know, that hits home. I mean, that strengthens the claim tremendously. I mean, you're thinking, wow, you know, if it's going to hold up to that and then he, you know, the burst pipe that he slaps the tape onto the pipe and yeah, it just while it, instantly while the water's pouring out. Right. I mean, yeah, that's another one that comes to mind is, um, and this, this shows that you may have to do some, some other stuff, but, um, one of the tire companies, you know, they're, they use the archers and they shoot mm -hmm. the tires cause they're run flat tires and they shoot it with an arrow and then they take right. it out and they drive it 50 miles. You know, I think it's BF Goodrich or one of those, but <clears throat> they show that, but they don't do a good job of, of tying the brand mm -hmm. to, to that demonstration, right. but you do get the idea that run flat tires, like run flat tires, people now know what it means, even yeah. if they don't know the brand. So if that's something that you want for mm -hmm. safety, for security, and we'll get into that actually in a couple more episodes from now, um, there's a lot of that, what they call identification, which is chapter eight right. that we'll talk about. Right. So we'll, we'll save that for later. But so yeah, how can you put, how could you put your product in action? Like make pro the product the star of the show, whether yeah. it's a service, whether it's an actual physical product, yeah. whether it's a supplement um, of some kind, you know, like a vitamin or like, how do you put that in action? A pain reliever. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that takes some creativity. It's going to take some thinking. Especially and, in print, you know, when you're writing this, yeah, when, describing and, it. Yeah, and you've got you've <clears> to <throat> have... Um, You've got to have, you've got to kind of walk yourself through, use your imagination and, and picture somebody yeah, and then tell the story like you're watching them do it mm -hmm. and then put that into, into print. And, right. 
that's the, I mean, that's the easiest way to do it. Then you can go back and kind of, you'd mentioned one of your, one of the books that you recommended, and I'm, I'm just getting off topic for a second, but you know, in terms of writing copy, um, you know, someone that if you, if you're someone that doesn't read a lot of, and I don't read a ton of novels, Mm -hmm. but it's always good every now and then I think to pick up a novel that somebody writes because you can get some ideas on writing vivid descriptions just by uh, reading and not, you know, you know, whatever genre that you're interested in. I think of like, you know, you were talking about on writing with Stephen King. Yeah. Um, you can pick up some really, really strong uh, tips on writing just from that alone. And even if you're not, even if you're just reading something by him, look at some of the descriptions that they use to paint the stories that they write. Yeah. And you can get some ideas straight from that on how to, you know, create the setting for your product as the hero and, and, you know, go from there. So it's, yeah, he gives a great example in that book, um, where he talks about, you know, the difference between describing something that's in mm-hmm. a room that's important, yeah, but not over describing it. Yeah. So in the book, Believing he talks it. about, there's a, a pink rabbit mm-hmm. in a gilded cage you know, some writers left to their own <laughs> devices would go overboard describing the cage and all the accents on yeah. it. And it was, you know, imported, the gold was imported from wherever. And yeah. Like they get in this whole thing about the cage yeah. when really all you need to know is that there's a pink rabbit in a cage in this room. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that's the weird thing that's going on in this, in this setting. And you Your really mind don't, is already feeling, yeah, it, you know, starting to the wonder. reader's mind will put the cage that it wants in there. Absolutely. Now, if you want to, if there's something particular about that cage or that yeah. aspect of your product, um, then yeah, go ahead and describe it. But mm-hmm. if it's not super material to that, if it's more of the setting and the place and, or yeah. this is the one thing that stands out, then just do that, but don't yeah. go overboard right. with it. And yeah. that, that can be easy to do. And it, of course that makes the copy boring because now you're over describing right. and you're losing the, you know, the, the intensification of the desire. So it's not a, so the, a lot of re- writers don't trust their readers to create the those details themselves, or they don't want them. They want to lay it, everything out for them, which totally goes against what any type of you know, in, especially in terms of persuasion. We've talked about this in, on some past episodes. Mm-hmm. You know, using simple language and letting your audience determine whatever your audience, you know, whatever side of the fence or demographic or you know whether it's politics or religion or whatever, what's whatever side they fall on, they're going to come to their own conclusion uh, themselves. But if you, if you put out too many details, then you take away that ability of them to kind of fill in their own paradigm. Well, you know, in, in person sales, you know, we talk about talking past the sale, Yep. you know, yep. like whether it's one-on-one or in a presentation and to a group, mm. it's really easy to talk past a sale and, and when you should have shut up because <laughs> yeah. people were sold 10 minutes ago Absolutely. and you're still talking yep. and now you've unsold them, Yep. you know, and you can lose a sale that mm-hmm. way. So yeah, that's, yep. a, that's a great point. Um, number three is he talks about bring in the reader. So we, we've, we put the product in action. We've, we've kind of told about the product mm-hmm. and now you want to bring the reader in. Yep. And he says, put your reader right smack in the middle of this, pro- of this product in action story. So there's a couple phrases that I love to use. And what's funny is a lot of times when I have clients, it makes them a little uncomfortable. <laughs> it's, it's so weird. Cause it's not a, like a crazy thing, but it's, I don't know. They, they kind of get put off by it hmm. and it's the word imagine or picture this. Mm-hmm. That is such a powerful phrase, right? Like it turns your brain on and some of the, you know, there's some great, great copy. There's some NLP stuff going on, neuro linguistic programming stuff that we'll go into way down the road probably at some point. But, um, when you start a conversation, a stage talk, um, a presentation or an email with something like imagine, Mm-hmm. picture this yeah. or, you know, something like that where it's kind of a visual trigger, then the brain automatically starts to say, to do whatever you say is next. Yeah. Right. Right. So in this example, he, he does picture this to your, to yourself. It's like, 
to me, your that, mind can't help but do. I mean, yeah, it's it, like don't look, you know, don't right. look, don't think of a red <laughs> elephant. Well, you're gonna think about a red elephant. Um, because just, I mean, if you try that on somebody, I can't imagine them like not being able to. When you say, if I if I just tell you, Sean, imagine uh, riding your Harley out on the open road out in Mexico or New Mexico out in the desert, you know, automatically you can't yeah. help but I mean, automatically your brain's like, yeah, because that's how our brains work. They work in pictures. Yeah. So yeah, to you, to, and it's an underused, underutilized technique in emails and copy and sales letters. Mm-hmm. It's a great way to start a conversation or start a, a sales presentation. Um, and it's a much more positive way. Mm-hmm. So if you don't like the, the darker pain first copy, mm-hmm. um, and a lot of people don't like that, right. or they have a hard time writing that, this is a good way to like start it in a positive sense. You can always come back to the pain, mm-hmm. which we'll talk about in a minute, but um, it is a good way. So he's got an example here of some copy that is about, um, about a, a, a product for a car. So he says, picture this to yourself. Next weekend, you go down to your car, the same tired car that you've been driving for years. You made only one simple change to that car, so easy that your 16-year-old son could do it. But now, when you turn on the ignition, a modern miracle of engineering science comes to life under your hood. So he's putting him in this picture of going down to the yep. garage. He's turning on the car. Right. From the very first moment, you'll see and feel the difference in that engine. When you release the emergency brake, your car will glide out of its parking space. Roll down the street with your foot hardly touching the gas pedal. Every 30 or 40 seconds, you'll give that car an extra shot of gas, feeling it spurt ahead, t- testing the new power that is singing underneath your foot. We ask you to pull up to another car at the stoplight of approximately the same year and make as your own. Wait until the light changes from red to green. Let the other car start first. Wait till the other car gets halfway across the street and then slam your foot down on the gas pedal. Before that car has even crossed the street, you will have caught up with him. For one brief second, you and that other car will be fi- will race fender to fender, and then you will flash away from him. You'll leave him full block behind. You will look in your rearview mirror and see the startled look of amazement on the other driver's face. <laughs> I mean, that's that's some strong yeah, copy. Yeah, it is. And you could, you know, in video, you could do that in a 10-second spot, sure. yeah. you know. Um, but in copy, I mean, most people will not do the work and most salespeople, copywriters will not do the work to draw out that much of a picture because they yeah. think it's too much copy and people won't read it. Right, right. But if that person likes cars mm-hmm. and wants their car to perform, in this example, they'll read every word of every it. Every word, yeah. And they'll be in that moment. Mm-hmm. You know, just like with the roses and the other example we talked mm-hmm. about. Um, if it's an accountant and they want to do their client's taxes faster and you've got software that will do yeah. that, Right. You could do the same thing. You sit down at your computer, you fire it up, you've just installed new accounting software, yep. and you you know you hit two keys on your keyboard to start the the calculations. The next thing you know, your work is done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you could just go on from there about how they spend <laughs> the rest of their day. Yeah, because it was so easy. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's and we it takes work and it takes a little courage. It does to draw that out Mm -hmm. because most people think, Oh, people don't have the intention, attention span. They have a, you know, whatever the saying is, you know, goldfish have longer attention spans. Sure. Well, that's true. If the person's not interested in absolutely the product or service you're talking about, but if they are, they have unlimited attention spans. And that's the thing people, I think if if it's compelling, I will stay tuned. Yeah. Speaking of compelling, here's another side note. Okay. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but so there's a new show on, I think NBC or something mm-hmm. like that. And yeah, I watch way too much TV, <laughs> but, um, it's the masks, the masked singer. Ah, so it's these it. celebrities, athletes, people from the past could be present, could be past that are stars uh, mm-hmm. in their own right. Right. And they wear these elaborate costumes. Like there's no way you could tell who it is. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, there was like an alien costume and a a um, bunny, a big bunny costume with like he was wearing a straight jacket. I mean, just like <laughs> like something you see on like Japanese TV. Sure, yeah. you know, just crazy costumes. And they sing a song. Uh-huh. And it's head to head, and then one person wins, and the judges are trying to figure out who it is. You're trying to figure out who it is. You talk about addicting. Like we were sitting there watching wow. it, and there'll be like I think there's three groups of two people or 
you know, in costume and they'll go head to head and they advance to the next round. Yeah. But only one person takes their mask off at the end of the show. And that's whoever the final, like whoever got eliminated Ah, takes their mask off. (laughs) And so you've got like six things, people you're trying to figure out and you only get to see one of them. Like it's so addictive. It was just, and they give you clues about who it could be. Oh, that's fascinating. So, um, we actually figured out one of them was Tommy Chong. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it was just. And this is film. This is filmed here in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. Yeah, it's a. It's on NBC. Nick Cannon's the host, and That's Jenny cool. McCarthy's mm-hmm. one of the judges. And <clears throat> it's just weird how, you know, we said like if it's compelling mm-hmm. and intriguing and like causes your brain to not be able to figure it out. And that's the whole hook of this show. Like you yeah. can't figure out what's what's that, yeah. coming next. And we've talked about the, that in the past with mm-hmm. the categorical imperative where if your brain can sort and figure out what it is, right. if your brain can solve the riddle, then you're it's over. Yeah. But if your brain can't, can't figure out it, what the riddle is, you're it wants more and, it's gonna stay there until it figures it out. Yep. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to put them in the story and let them be a hero of the story. That's why people sit through a movie for an hour and a half to two hours. Mm-hmm. Because if it's a good movie, you put yourself in that character. You yeah. you identify with that character, mm-hmm. and you can sit for two hours and watch a movie, and it feels like ten minutes. Yeah, you know if it's a good movie. And there's other movies that yeah DC movies that, <laughs> that you're check- yeah. <laughs> that you so you're checking see. your phone every every so often. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so moving on real quick, number four is show him how to test your claim. I love this. This is yes. probably the most one of the most underutilized. Um, pieces again it feels like i say that about everything in this book but it's true because most Mm -hmm. people do that yeah take the easy way out on copy and and sales presentations but just to turn to create a demonstration that they can test either right when they get the product or even sometimes in the copy itself yep you know so well it goes to like they say if if you tell me if you make a claim you know, I'm like, eh, but if, you know, if I figure it out myself, if you put me in, into the seat where I'm doing the demonstration and let me decide if it works, mm-hmm. then my mind, my mind is made up because then you've said, okay, I'm not just telling you, I want you to evaluate or test it yourself. Right. And so when I test it myself, then I'm, con- you know, I've confirmed that product works. So. Yeah. So he gives the example here of, um, you know, he's selling a book and yep. the book was give me, it's from a classic ad. Give me one evening and I'll give you a push button memory. Right. It says, so take this book out, take this book and turn to page 39, read eight short pages, no more, then put down the book, mm. review your own mind in your own mind, the one simple secret I've shown you, and then get ready to test your new automatic memory. And then he goes through this whole thing about write down like 20 things yeah. and see how many, and he basically gives you a recipe for what's going to happen when you read the book. Right. So you can test the book. You can test it immediately when you get the book. And a lot of people will do this. Like they'll save the web page they bought from, or they'll save the direct mail that they bought from until the product gets there. And then they'll follow a direction like this mm-hmm. and use it first. Yeah. It's also a great thing you could do in your follow-up email sequences. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, when you get, let's say I'm selling, you know, now a lot of the products that come like through Amazon, you get delivery notification. Yep. Hey, we see your product just arrived, you know, yeah. that would be a great place for a supplement user or any product, really physical product or a course or anything else. You could do a follow up email sequence once you got delivery notification Absolutely. and say, Hey, try this with your new, mm-hmm. whatever, mm-hmm. you know, widget a, and let us know what happens yep. or this should happen. If it doesn't let us know and we'll return it. Or, Mm -hmm. you know, you could come up with some type of test they could do immediately with it. And, you know, just to reinforce, yeah, just to reinforce it. And this works. I mean, it, it, yeah. And it shows a lot of confidence in you as the manufacturer, absolutely. the, the, you know, the product producer. Um, he's got one hint in here about, if you like cars, you'll like a lot of the examples in this chapter because he's got a lot of like spark plug examples and yeah, you can fuel tell. additives and things like that. Um, but w- so give somebody a test. Let them help, help them figure out mm. a test they could use. Number mm-hmm. five is stretch out your benefits in time. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So you want to like let them see themselves living with this product right. for the rest of their lives or, yep. for, or until they get the result they want or whatever it might be. So if it's a weight loss pill, you don't talk about just the first 30 days. You talk about their new life 10 years from now because they've kept the weight off. Mm-hmm. And you just really stretch out. Like they may have stopped taking the, the supplement, you know, at year one, but you're going to show them how the residual effect of that, yeah. even 10 years later, is they're playing with their kids and their grandkids. Right. And they're doing more activities and they're outdoors more and all that kind of stuff. So really like um, extend out the benefits even further than maybe your product does because there is a ripple effect for anybody's product or service. Yeah. And a lot, a lot of good, um, advertisers will do that. They'll show them, you know, whether that means a happier family, Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's a Viagra or whatever, you know, you're, yeah, (laughs) you're out on the beach with your wife and you know, things are great. Yeah. (laughs) Stronger marriage, happier family. (laughs) That's right. Raise at work. You yeah, know, everybody. Like, yeah, they're, you notice the couple's always just extremely happy. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and I mean, you can do that with any product. You can you can draw out the, and you know it may be in time, it may be in like circumference around their life, the different areas of their life. You got a fitness product that that makes their relationship better, that makes mm-hmm. their performance at work better, that makes yeah. you know everything better. Um, so you can, it's multi dimensional as far as sp- spreading out the time, right. So number six, bring in an audience. Mm-hmm. Um, this you kind of just bring in other people. So the, I think the most famous ad of this is they laughed when I sat down at the piano, but when yeah. I started to play, mm-hmm. you know, and that got turned into ads like, you know, they laughed when the waiter spoke to me in French and I, or I replied in perfect French or something. I ordered in perfect French. I can't remember what that one was, but you start to create like, I think some of the old, like, um, muscle ads, you know, like the wimpy kid gets the, the sand kicked kicked in his face face, and he becomes this muscle guy. Right. And then people are like looking at him and amazed and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a lot of that where you can start to put, you start to talk in the ad about what the audience is seeing from the person who bought the product. And it, that's, that's really powerful because it, it lets, it really taps into what we, what we'll talk about in the next, um, in chapter eight, which is identification. It Mm -hmm. starts to tap into that a little bit. So how can you let other people tell the story of what's going on in your ideal consumers or or buyers life? Like once they use that product, Mm -hmm. you know, just again, using weight losses that people at the office are noticing that your clothes fit better or yeah. asking you if you're working out, right. you know, that kind of stuff is, is really, really powerful. Yeah. And the last one for this episode is show um, experts approving. Yeah. So bring in some experts and let them approve of your product, whether it's a, and we see this all the time on TV, celebrity endorsements, not just TV, but just magazines. Yeah. Um, or even, you know, basic consumer items. You think about toothpaste or toothbrushes, nine out of 10 dentists recommend, Yeah. you know, well, who are these dentists? You know, <laughs> yeah. or two out of two podcasters recommend <laughs> black right. mocha stout. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, if you can show, um, I don't know if we'd be an expert, but <laughs> if you can show some experts, you know, he goes back to the gardening, the, the rose example and, you know, the Garden and Society of America yeah. names these best blooming roses ever sure. or whatever. Yep. To use that type of third party proof. Um, and you can look this stuff. I mean, especially now with, with Google, I remember when I was writing some copy for like, I would just, when I write my first draft, I would just write. Mm-hmm. And if there was somewhere I thought would be a good quote or a good testimonial or a good statistic, I would just write, find testimonial that says blah, 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 blah. And I would just put it in brackets and I mm-hmm. would come back to it later and go research that. Yeah. Or a statistic, especially like find a, st- a statistic that says nine out of 10, you know, mm-hmm. dentist degree or whatever. Yeah. And thanks to Google. Now you can find just about anything you want. Oh yeah. Statistic wise to prove your point. Right. One way or the other. Yeah. You can make statistics. So you can just throw those in as you're writing or as you're thinking mm-hmm. about a PowerPoint presentation that you're going to do. Just put it in there as a bookmark and don't lose the flow of the writing. Yeah. This is a totally different tip than the book, but 
get that first draft done and then go back and do your research and fill in those things and find pictures or graphs or whatever for it. Um, I found that's a really powerful way to, because if you don't find the statistic right away, then it kind of breaks your momentum and you're like, Oh, it's kind of a letdown. But if you just put it as a placeholder, that that's what you want. Just like throw something in there as a placeholder, like in brackets, like, eh. Yeah. And sometimes like, if I don't have a headline yet, because sometimes the headline comes out while you're writing mm-hmm. the body copy. Sure. Um, I'll just put really awesome headline goes here <laughs> and on my Word doc or yeah. Google doc right. or whatever. And then I'll come back and sure. fill it in later. I'll tweak it later. Mm-hmm. You know, I may have a list of 10 that I'm working on, but I don't have the exact wording yet. So I'll just put a placeholder there. So, yeah. But yeah, to show experts approving, you can you can always find a statistic or a group of people that have endorsed X, Y, or Z product it's or service. A, yeah. Nowadays, and it doesn't it's... have to be a super big celebrity mm. or a super big expert. Mm. Like it can be, I mean, it really can be just about anything. It could be a minor celebrity. It could be just a, you know, a doctor who works at some obscure, yeah. you know, place or a quote from psychology today magazine right. or scientific American, or even, you know, um, people magazine for that matter. I mean, yeah, you know, that's still an authority figure to yep. some, to a lot of people. Yeah. And on. it's, it's amazing that, you know, the power that that has has over people when they're making, you know, buying decisions. Yep. We trust experts. Yep. I, I go do. in last week, buy a bottle of wine and, you know, you see labels that say wine or wine spectator. And you know, when you see that, yeah, exactly. And you automatically you're thinking, oh, it, this must be pretty damn good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's two little seals on this, um, black mocha stout here, yep. you know, and, and independently family owned since 1994. Like that's not even like a thing, but it's, it's designed like a seal. Right. Right. So, so it you... looks like it's important. <laughs> I mean, just they could have put anything on that. Yeah. I mean, it just, it can be, yeah, it's, it's amazing how quickly, because if somebody's already wanting what you're you're mm-hmm. offering and you're doing a good job with it, mm-hmm. it doesn't take a lot no. to continue to push that momentum forward. Right. Doesn't mean you can just throw anything up. It needs to be real. Sure. Um, but there is a lot of a lot of stuff that people don't use that they could be using for yeah. sure. Absolutely. Well, that's halfway through this chapter. We've got some more points. Yeah, we should probably. I think we hit our. We've hit our time. People are probably at work or wherever they're going listening to this. Or, yep. And so, they're, they're already, they're sitting in the parking lot as we speak <laughs> asking, when will this be over? So I'm, I can go in. I'm already late for I'm, work. I'm late. Yeah. <laughs> I have to take a longer lunch break. There you go. Well, this is great. Um, again, we'll continue on our next episode. Uh, thanks for listening guys. And you can find us over at, uh, again, persuasion by the com or, uh, any of your podcast, uh, platforms, um, Stitcher, um, I don't think we're on Spotify yet. But we'll probably soon be. And uh, uh, iTunes, or yeah, if you're iTunes Radio or any of your uh, Google apps, your um, Android apps for uh, podcasting, you can find us there. So we are there. All right, we're everywhere. Everywhere. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.